This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, it is the Indie Mayhem Show, the show where we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We got a great guest on here uh, today that I can't believe I haven't had on this show, amazingly, but I guess we did do something else in the studio that confused me. Uh, but we'll get into that. Uh, of course, please go uh, support this show. Check out more things uh, uh, in our pro wrestle pro wrestling podcast scape at wrestlingmayhemshow.com and of course you can support the show also at indie wrestling.us where a lot of people uh, on this show from the past years uh, are featured over there on on the VODs and of course on the indie wrestling network and of course we also do have the patreon page for the wrestling mayhem show podcast at patreon.com slash wrestling mayhem show you'll get a few extra uh, bits and interviews and before the shows and, and extras uh, throughout the month if you support over there for as little as a dollar a month and we do appreciate everybody that does support the show over there and you can get a shout out over on wrestling mayhem show from whoever may be in that week uh as well so so our guest this week is somebody again he was in the studio and this is what confused me because because the, me- the the memory came up he was in the studio and apparently we were talking about studio wrestling uh, a project that one day we'll see the light of day. I got to get back with my producer on that one. <laughs> so, but anyways, we have the legendary Hank Hudson, uh, uh, the 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 voice of Pittsburgh wrestling is in, in my uh, uh, consideration, <laughs> at least in my my 15 years of being around this stuff. So how are you doing, Hank? I don't know about legendary. I mean, if people uh, see me, they always see me in my tuxedo, all the wrestling fans. They see me here, they're probably wondering who this guy is. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> but then they go to another wrestling show, and they're like, hey, it's Hank again. <laughs> they get to know you over the time, right? <laughs> so. Well, this is the way I look 99% of the time, and I'm well-dressed even for that 99%. <laughs> You're in full podcast mode. Perfect, perfect. Well, th- thank you, Hank, for coming back into the studio, especially in these times. You're probably looking for re- reasons to get out of the house these days. <laughs> well, most, most of us That's where are. I've been the most since... Uh, uh, March. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, but uh, I, the, I think I think the tacos helped as well. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, so so you know, this is the Get to Know You show. You know, I know a lot of people see you out at these wrestling shows, but I want to kind of get more in depth. You know, uh, at the, the you know, the, I I always hear Hank stories. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you you've been great about um um resurfacing a lot of history of things that happened in in, in around Pittsburgh and in the well, region and everything. <laughs> you, well, you lived it. <laughs> I've been there. Live, you know. This is this is his Facebook memories getting shared with everybody else. <laughs> so. well, this ain't stuff I looked up on the internet. I mean, no, I've no. lived it and, and been there. You know. I want to get into that, but first, a little get to know you. Uh, uh, we, we were talking a little bit pre-show about your your long history with wrestling. Yeah. Tell me, um, what is your earliest memory of professional wrestling? Just viewing it, yeah. experiencing it, getting into it. Well, I started watching in '65, but it had been on in Pittsburgh since late '58, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, and sometimes it's switching through the channels before I got into it. Uh, and, and earlier in the 60s, my mother would see it and she would call those guys an income poops. And she would tell me <laughs> wrestling is the lowest of all sports. Guys that can't make it in football or in boxing, they go into wrestling. This is early 60s. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and uh, she wouldn't even let me watch it then. But then around 65, so many of my friends at school would, were going to the Civic Arena Bruno was already the WWWF uh, world's champ by then. And Mm -hmm. I started watching probably about the the, uh, spring of 65. And I've been like hooked ever since. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. So what was it that guy was? Was Bruno one of the guys that kind of like captured your imagination back then? No, I was a rare bird then. The only thing I was ever in my life ahead of my time, I was a heel wrestling fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, I used to root against Bruno. I mean, not out loud at the arena because people would would start fights (laughs) and everything. Uh, You know, uh, once I started going, I never rooted. 
rooted out loud for Bruno, but you know, deep inside, I wanted to, I wanted the heels to win because they were more interesting. Yeah, I mean, Bruno is like so so gentlemanly on the air and everything, mm-hmm. and I like the heels like screaming and hollering. They were colorful and exciting, you know. So I was no Bruno fan. And in fact, I was on another show a few times with John Pithers. I think you had him and his guys on here one time. Uh, oh, the Pro Wrestling News and Views guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was on their show a number of times. They told me they always asked for a top five. You know, <laughs> and uh, and they told me I was the only one ever on their show that didn't have Bruno in his top five. He was in my <laughs> bottom five, not my top five. I, I like the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome. So 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 like what bad guys were kind of getting your attention back then? Oh, back when I started, uh, Cowboy Bill Watts was in Pittsburgh okay. like, for his only time. I've heard. Some- I mean, he got more famous way uh, all over the rest of the country, you mm-hmm. know, between 1965 and and later. But uh, Doctor Bill Miller, he was my all time favorite. He was a real life doctor, a veterinarian. Uh, you know, until he died, uh, you know, graduate of, of Ohio State. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, he was like 315 pounds, around six foot six. He was a big, mean, tough looking guy. <laughs> Those are the guys I like. And that's why I don't watch today's wrestling. I don't want to watch uh, like a little Adam Cole in the ring. You know, mm-hmm. I want to mm-hmm. see like big, tough brutes in the you, ring. You were, it was the, it was really the bigger than life guys. Yeah. 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 They were all larger in life. The heels, they were yeah. colorful. Yeah. And if they, if they weren't uh, loquacious, you know, they had a manager that was, yeah. you know, and the managers yeah. were like, like exciting, you know, they yeah. could talk a mile a minute, motor moth, like before the days of Jim Cornette, you know, there's, there was plenty of like uh motor moth guys like him, you know, except they were tougher looking, you know, mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. Cornette, you know. So, so, so you, you, you're, you're, you're experiencing the wrestling, you're going to civic arena, uh, 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 quietly, quietly, uh, 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 uh celebrating to yourself when Bruno's getting his. Uh, <laughs> you know, he would lose sometimes. He would never lose the title. Yeah, you know? of course. So he'd lose on a cutout, or he'd be bleeding too severely or something, yeah. even though he's still like fighting back as good as he was at the start of the match. You yeah, know? They, yeah. They'd give the guy like a bloody a blood stoppage uh, victory, but uh-huh. not the title. Yeah. Well, I, I went home happy when he lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so at what point did you uh, uh, find your way or, or, or you know, into – the professional professional wrestling scene as you have. Oh, I when I finally got a car and had the money to go to shows outside of Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. I, I started going to what they used to call them outlaw shows, like a 1975 as was. If you weren't with the main groups, you know they had all the territories yeah. in, yeah. and they'd stick together as far as fighting off what they called the outlaw groups. Okay, uh, so I started going to one of those shows and. And they always needed, you know, since they paid little or nothing, you know, they always needed a ring announcer or a referee. So I just, I got my feet wet on those kind of shows and mm-hmm. gradually built up a reputation over the years, uh, you know, you know, and it's just, this uh, steamrollered into more stuff. So, so tell me what an outlaw show kind of, you know, obviously, you know, when we think those, you know, we think of those, those of Civic Arena kind of uh, shows with Bruno and stuff, or like that was what wrestling was back then. Uh, but what do these outlaw shows kind of more resemble what today's independent shows are? Uh, they were different in that the guy, the guys on the show, uh, they would do jobs like on Studio Wrestling, okay. Uh, or they'd go up to Cleveland. Cleveland had a TV show on Channel 43 for years. They'd do jobs maybe in Cleveland or go up to Buffalo for whatever TV they had there. Okay. Yeah, yeah they were, and they'd go to the WWF, like starting in 75, there was a wrestler named Billy Berger. Uh, he was from like Elwood City for years. Uh, he started promoting. That's uh, he's the one that gave me my first break. Uh, he uh, after the shows in Salem, Ohio, ended where I first started going. You know, he started running Northern West Virginia, you know, like Monsville and Clark's uh, Clarksburg and Elkins and mm-hmm. Fairmont and you know tons like that. Um, he used to go out and do jobs like Gorilla Monsoon. A lot of people don't know that he was actually the promoter in Pittsburgh when Studio Wrestling ended and and Super Pro Wrestling ended in '74 on Channel 11. Uh, the WWWF took over running in Pittsburgh in 75 and Monsoon was the behind the scenes promoter. So he'd tell Billy Berger, you know, they, they used to tape WWF TV in the late seventies, like every three weeks, Mm -hmm. they'd film the one show on a Tuesday and then the other show on a Wednesday and do three hours, you know, and they'd have Billy Berger bring out like local guys uh, you know, Monsoon would say, hey, bring yourself and five other guys out to uh, Allentown and Hamburg, PA, you know, for taping. So that's how those guys would they'd probably make more money there than they were like running the uh, uh, working on the indie shows. So. Well, it was a different world where like, like, you know, the, you know, seen like job guys where it's a job, you know, and a lot of them made pretty good on a lot of that stuff, like careers out of that stuff. Yeah, but I'd also use a lot of the guys that were a little better mm-hmm. They'd use them in the opening matches. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Like there's a, a one guy, well, he lives in Ohio uh, now, but he was a local guy from Dormont, uh, the Sicilian beast. Yeah, he's a go- uh, they'd use him on a lot of the opening matches at the Civic Arena, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you get work on those shows too, or or they'd run a high school. Like they'd run the Civic Arena usually on a Friday, but sometimes they'd run a Thursday and a Saturday around that when they had the guys out this way. Mm-hmm. And they'd use a few local guys. Plus, they needed guys to drive guys from the airport, the uh, motels to to the to the venues. You know, so those uh, local jo- uh, job guys would like drive the guys back and forth. Mm-hmm. You know, also the double duty. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're, um, you know, so you're getting into this, and 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 and. and I understand um, your Facebook is incredible, <laughs> first of all. I'll just say that. Well, I have a lot of time to do it now that I'm retired. You know? <laughs> so so if, you don't, if you don't follow Hank on, on, on Facebook, and I, I encourage you to, um, you post very regularly these kind of flashback posts of cards, like on this day and so-and-so year, this happened and you have flyers and in a match rundown and the entire like breakdown of that. Um, and, and I understand like, this has been like you, you are, you actually like, you're taking notes at every wrestling show, correct? Yeah. Like, like scoring a baseball game. Yeah. Yeah. I got started with that. Um, like ring, there used to be, you, you heard of the, the ring, the boxing magazine. Yeah. Well, yeah. until the eighties, uh, they had a sister magazine was wrestling, but it wasn't monthly like the boxing was usually quarterly or, okay, or, okay. or you know, approximately quarterly. Whenever they got enough for a full issue, they put one out. And they had these agate size print things in the back with like results. Yeah. And I was wondering why you never seen anything in on Pittsburgh. And I thought, you know, I didn't know that you didn't get paid anything for sending them in. <laughs> so I never send them in. I thought they were like regular reporters that they they hire yeah, or something. Yeah. And then I just send it in on a lark run like 74. And, and they ended up, somebody told me, hey, your name's in the magazine. You know, I didn't even know it was that. So so I started taking more notes on the show to be, you know, because I was relying on my memory when I did yeah. the first one. And, uh, you know, and that, that's how I got started. Even when the magazine, I was always hoping, you know, it, it went out of business like in 79. And it came back for one issue in uh, in 83. And then they sold it to some Norman Keatser or somebody. And it was like a completely different format but um i was always hoping that would come out and i just got in the habit like being when i'm at a pirates game that you like to stay awake you know i i i score the whole game you know that you know to keep more into the game and yeah so that's what i do with the wrestling shows even like a lot of those shows i post like some people think i'm working all them you know yeah, it, yeah. i mean i've worked a good bit of them but there's a lot of them i was just there i was just another mark in the in the crowd you know yeah. enjoying the action yeah I, even at those shows and people are looking at me wondering do you work for a newspaper or, or, <laughs> you know and meanwhile i'm trying to concentrate on the match because I don't want to get in a, a talking to somebody to miss the finish of the match. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's astonishing. Because, because, because I, I, you know, like I remember for a few times, you know, like I, I, I rise or something. I hear you like come up to somebody who's like, "Hey, what did that finish with?" and and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and also, not many announcers give the time of the match at the end when you're announcing the winner. And it knows Hank was always the one that did because you're also timing the match as part of your your record. Yeah, I think it, you know it makes it sound more like an official c- contest. Absolutely. You know, so I, I do that, uh, and um, you know, I write down the match finish and everything. You know, it makes it sound more official. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that's one of the coolest things. So, 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 I mean, it, it, how you know? So, how did you kind of grow into like like I'm going to start putting these out on Facebook? Is this something that's been happening for a while, or or like how did that kind of kick in? Well, I'm always behind the times. I was the last one to have a VCR and last one to have a cell phone. Mm-hmm. And I finally got an iPhone like in 2015 and I discovered like Facebook and seen all this great other wrestling stuff on there. So around sometime at late 2015, I started putting my own stuff on. And I have all these flyers and all these posters. I mean, you saw my, uh, I have my post on uh, my uh, studio wrestling programs. Remember for mm-hmm. the Matt Carlin's thing you taped? And yeah, yeah. We had them all yeah. over the floor here, yeah. like spread, you know, to get a picture of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I put, I've been putting all my stuff on, uh, you know, that I have on uh, Facebook. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so, so do you, do, you know, I, and I always see such great reactions for this, like, you know, uh, and for me, like, you know, even seeing like stuff come up from, from my eras or seeing things that happen in indie wrestling, you know, and like hearing names that, you know, like, you know, I don't know much about Paul Atlas's career mm-hmm. other than getting him in here and, and get talked to him about it. Right. So it's cool to see yeah. those kinds of like pairings and a young Brandon K and, and things like that, or even just like, you know, 
uh, uh, the, the you know WWF guys that came through at the time when you're yeah. just like wait he wrestled here and like this year that does, it was like that's wild you know that kind of stuff like that uh, uh you get you get a lot of responses from those uh i get anywhere from 10 to 50 for everything i post you know oh jeez <laughs> i mean I, a lot of people tell me they look at them but they never react to them so it's probably like a number more that look oh, at yeah. it and never yeah, uh, yeah you know, put anything on there to let me know they saw it. It's definitely, I, I, I probably don't react to everyone, but it's definitely like when you scroll through the feed, I stop for a moment for yeah. sure. <laughs> I'd be like, Oh, okay. You know? yeah, I try to do one or two a day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know for me, uh, I was, uh, particularly fascinated. You posted one, uh, several months ago that was a WWE or F taping. It was, um, like 93, 94 at wheeling and looking at like the list of like 12 matches, and, you know, realizing, like, I probably saw some of these on, like, Wrestling Challenge or something because I didn't have cable at the time, you know, or on yeah. a Coliseum video and, like, how they were all marked out and just the wild way that they did shows back then. Well, they used to, do those, they used to do those tapings monthly yeah. and do four weeks at a time. Nuts. I've been at one time I was up in Erie. I was there till 12.04 the next day. I huh. mean, you know, it started at 7 o'clock. They just go one after another, bang, 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 and, and it. A lot of times it's 30 to 32 matches they would do. A, just one after one guy would be going back to the dressing room and the other one's already – the job guy would always come out first yeah. you know, off camera. You know, it'd already be in the ring when I'd introduce the uh, the guy that's going to squash him in a few minutes. You know? So so, so uh, you and I have both experienced overloaded indie wrestling cards with like 12 matches in three and a half hours, I'm yeah. sure. Um, how in the world did they did – they, keep the audience going <laughs> for that much time well see they, they'd have a couple dark main events either they would be dark or they wouldn't be taped or they'd be taped for what they had what they called coliseum video yeah then. yeah and uh so that uh, i remember going to one show here's a funny story in erie i was like sitting next to a guy and his girlfriend mm -hmm. and he came that's when um when the undertaker was still a heel and he was in a body bag match against uh the ultimate warrior uh when he was champion and, and this guy kept saying when are they gonna put that match on i knew for a fact that they were saving that for last because they yeah. don't want the people to leave yeah. you know uh they're trying to keep the audience there and, and i'm hoping you know we're opposite uh, polar opposites of what we want to see you know i'm hoping i'd be i'd stay there all night you know uh you know until four in the morning you know if they kept putting matches I, mm -hmm. that guy just wanted to see that match so he could go home mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's all it's all part of it isn't it yeah. um so there was a, a you know a story that I, I I was fortunate to be we were talking beforehand uh, I, uh the present and happened to be filming for for a friend of the show um their match and uh Mick Foley was involved and I had heard this story before actually um but it was fun to hear it from Mick Foley and uh and Hank Hudson's um um uh Hank Hudson and I you know what I I read Mick Foley's book and I think he recounts the story in his very first book yeah, page seventy nine and eighty of the, har the hardback. <laughs> Hold on, I got a cover over here. I got a, the paperback over here on the shelf. The hardcovers at home. Uh, <laughs> so, so tell me, so tell the people that, that maybe didn't read Foley's book, uh, the two of them out there, uh, <laughs> that uh, um, um, about about your your uh, connection to Foley there. Well, he was trained by Dominic Danucci. Uh, he had a wrestling school up. I think it was at the old Freedom High School up in Beaver County, and um, yeah, and and that was That's... that was the first time I saw him. And there was another guy. He he was on the card. He was going to wrestle named Kurt Kaufman. He's from somewhere here in the South Hills, or at least he used to be uh, mm -hmm. Carrick or somewhere. Um, and I, so I went up to Mick Foley. I thought he was Kurt Kaufman. I said, "Are you Kurt Kaufman?" And <laughs> you know, and and then he told me, you know, he's going to be Cactus Jack Foley. That was the name he was uh, going to use. And, and, and I never even heard that. You know, and, I, and he was pretty new at the time. Like, what was he? Like, well, that was his first match. Oh, was his, his first match. Yeah, okay. it was his very first match. I met him. Yeah, he never yeah. had him. He didn't even know where he was going to be from. Yeah, he wanted to be. Uh, he's going to be Cactus Jack, and he wanted to be from Bloomington, Indiana. And I told him, I says, I don't think there are any cactuses in uh, Indiana. <laughs> and then he corrected me, like laughing. He said, the plural of cactus is uh, cacti. You know, he didn't put that in this book. But, uh, <laughs> I told him about that up in Campbell, Ohio, by Youngstown, the show you were at. Yeah, uh, yeah. Around, uh, I guess it was around like almost two years ago. Yeah. Now. Um, yeah, and uh, so I. And, so I worked at the U.S. Postal Service at, in Warrendale. Uh, they used to call it the Big Bulk Mail Center for years. I think it got a different name now, like NDC or something. But, yeah, I worked there 34 years. And I, for 19 years, that I was on a sack sorter. 
you know, where we, you know, we key the zip codes and, you know, goes to where it's supposed to go. And, uh, and I was seeing sacks all the time. I never heard of this town, Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. So I always thought I'd be like a great name for like a, for a time for a wrestler to be. So when he said cactuses, uh, uh, like think of now, I would just wonder if there's even any cactuses near uh, Truth or Consequences to tell the truth, maybe in Arizona. <laughs> but yeah, he he used that name and he used it up until the time he he morphed into mankind. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, um, and I'd see it in PWI all the time. Like they'd have like the territories, like the top ten, and it'd be Cactus Jack Foley or Cactus Jack Manson, whatever name he was using at the time, from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And I would tell people over the years a few times, yeah, I'm the one who gave him his name. I did his first match. But since there's like so many like bullshitters and liars and wrestling, mm-hmm. you know, they look at me like I was nuts. I was just another one telling a tall tale and embellishing my resume. So I quit telling it until that book come out and then uh, – <laughs> I don't know how many people told me, you know, I, uh, is that you in that book? You know, I mean, so, so in 40, I've been ring announcing uh, indie wrestling 45 years. Mm-hmm. I tell them that's the one time I was in the right place and at the right time, you know, and that's the only thing I'm famous for in 45 years. I can't recall. Did he use your name in the book? Uh, yeah, Hank. He Hudson, did, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My Facebook page, you know, by the way, is under my real name because I heard they were like, uh, like getting rid of like a cons that, that we're using pseudonyms. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had to put it under my real name, but yeah. you can still connect to it by by uh, Sergeant Hank Hudson. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm double checking if I actually put up the part where he talks about that in the clip. Uh, we, if not, I will put it up by the time yeah. this interview goes up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, oh, I think it is up there. If you, yeah, we'll link that in the chat. But if you look up Lady Frost versus Jocelyn with McFoley, uh, he comes out, and I believe he does uh, bring that up. Yeah, at the beginning of this. Yeah, it's just so. hard to understand over the PA. Oh yeah, you know, we like, were not. It was a big yeah. gymnasium and stuff, but still, you know, because I don't know that there's many instances of him telling the story, and they have it there with the guy that did that gave him the name. So that's 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 fantastic. So, uh, so so I mean, you you've had brushes with a lot of people, you know, including Mc and early Mick Foley, you know, over the years. You know, obviously, you know, some great wrestling towns come come out of Pittsburgh or through Pittsburgh over the years. Um, is there anybody else that that you recall that that you you've had some brushes with over the years too? Oh, especially in the in the in the seventies, I would work mm-hmm. a lot of indie shows. With a lot of stars or like from the past, you know. Yeah. So uh, I started working on indie shows in Ohio. I got to work with a lot of the guys from the um, Detroit big time wrestling era. They had the Sheik was the promoter. I, I, I did a few yep. shows with the Sheik, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> introduced him. I refereed on shows that he was uh, on, but I never got to do his match. Mm. Uh, yeah, guys like the Sheik and like Bulldog Briar, Johnny Pyres, guys that were like on Cleveland's TV. Uh, you know, a uh, bulldog Don Kent, Al Costello it used to be in the Kangaroos, like a famous uh, legendary tag team. Bobo Brazil, I I did cool. a number of shows with. Um, in fact, there's a clip of me somebody like found a few years ago, me interviewing Bobo on some like short-lived TV show that uh, I was a TV commentator for on Cleveland Cable. Yeah, you can find that easily on uh, somewhere in cyberspace. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you see, um, especially like with uh, people posting uh, old matches like this? Like, like, are you are you seeing memories like that kind of pop up as well as you're, you're finding shows that, that you are a part of? Oh, yeah. I find like a lot of stuff like posters and, and flyers of shows that I, that I don't have in my collections, you know, so I uh, do a, like a photo shot of them and keep them in my gallery and mm-hmm. use them on my own post. Uh, yeah. Going into the 90s, once uh, the WrestleMania area started, yeah. once those WWF guys, you know, uh, were let go and started doing indies, I, I just did like shows with like so many of those guys. Uh, mm-hmm. I had a promoter up in young, the guy that promoted at Campbell, Ohio show you were at with Foley. He just died within the past years. Oh. I worked with him like starting around like the middle eighties, like for like over 30 years, he'd run, he'd periodically run big shows when wrestling is hot. And he used all those ex WWF guys, like the Bushwhackers, like Greg Valentine, demolition acts, Mr. Hughes, you know, anybody who had like a half a name, you know, he, he'd, <laughs> he'd be on the show. And then, Bob, I, I've been working for Bobby Fulton. I don't know if you heard of him from the Fantastics. Uh, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. ring announced his first match in, in the same building that Mick Foley had his first match, like in 1977. And he's been like going over 40 years, but he's he just come off having cancer. He's supposed oh. to be in remission. But yeah, I worked on and off on his promotions. And, and he uses like all the, like a lot of the old ECW guys, Smoky Mountain wrestling guys, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as well as WWE guys and WCW guys. 
guys. Yeah, he has a potpourri of like former stars on his shows. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um so so uh, uh you you've also seen the evolution of wrestling in Pittsburgh. Yeah, well, in, indie wrestling especially, yeah. Yeah. It was like almost dead until like uh, 80. You, you'd have a show here and there, but it was so prohibitive to run indie wrestling because the State Athletic Commission, people think that they're like uh, imposing now, mm-hmm. but but they're m- mild kittens compared to the way they were <laughs> pre-89. to It was hard to run an indie show because you had to use their uh, referees you know, mm-hmm. and I, 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 I'm talking about late uh, 80s dollars, like when they were finally like phasing out. You have to pay each referee. If you used up to five matches, you can get away with one for 100 bucks. Mm-hmm. But if you had more than five, you had to have a second one for another 100 bucks. Mm-hmm. You had to pay their ring announcer um, $75. And it's not like I, this guy was a pro or anything. They, they had guys that never even watched wrestling on TV, uh, would mispronounce the, the names of the wrestlers at the Civic Arena. They had, the, they had their own ring announcers. Yeah, they had the ones that used Bo- that did boxing for them yeah but they'd, they'd make you use them until 89 you couldn't use your own guy wow. like i couldn't work illegally in pa i started in 75 yeah i couldn't work legally until mid 89 because uh you know they you know i, I had no uh connection to any politician or you know uh they're yeah. all spoil system appointees you know yeah 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 whoever the governor was you know he'd appoint his own local commissioner and then and it was like down the line you know all his buddies uh you know um yeah, and you had to hire a timekeeper, you know, a guy to ring the bell for 75 a pop, you know. And, and then you had all these deputies that would be at the door that were counting tickets, yeah. you know, uh, and, and everything, and, like, like walking around. And, uh, well, you had to use your doctor, but you still got to use one now. So yeah, I, guess, yeah. I guess that's a wash there. And that was all off the top before even any of the guys on the show get paid. Yeah. You know, they're supposed to supervise, but all they were doing is skimming off all the cream. And then the guys who were actually doing the show were just getting what was left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, so, so, wow. I, did, I didn't know how, how crazy that was back then. So, so, <laughs> so you're, you're also outlaw for, for like 15 years. As yeah. Well. I did a few bootleg <laughs> shows. Uh, in fact, we did one one time. Um, they knew we were running. It was up uh, at St. George's in the Allentown section of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I called like Channel 2, 4, and 11 because they said they were going to like raid us with the state police mm-hmm. you know, if we ran the show. And uh, we ran it anyhow. And, and uh, the one the one channel did like a, like a lengthy Ralph Ionati. I think he's still on the air on Channel 2. He was up there in like an 84 or 85 whenever we ran the show. And yeah, he's doing a report to state police. We thought we we're coming. That was just a bluff by them, you know. Uh, yeah. Channel 11 just showed like like film highlights when they were like ending the, like ending the news. But yeah, yeah, we we thought we were going to get raided by the state police. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's wild because, even, I mean, you know, obviously wrestling wasn't, you know, quote out for for what it was and everything um, until probably the mid night early 90s, I guess, uh, with Vince and everything. But uh, so so but the, but the I I I have so many questions about how that worked back then. And I didn't think about going this way with it, but, but so the athletic commission pretty much behaved as if it was, it was a sport just like anything else. Correct? Oh yeah. We had a couple like nutty commissioners, like in yeah. 1969, I talked about this when we did the Matt Carlin's thing yeah. in 1969, they had a brand new commissioner and he thought he was supposed to enforce everything. And he was disqualifying <laughs> everybody like, like meddling in every single match. Okay. And the okay. people were getting pissed as it was. So, and, and then Bruno's match, here's the best part. When Bruno was wrestling Waldo Von Eric, you know, Bruno always gets beat up, beat up for a bit in this match. And then he like morphs up and he's impervious to pain and goes yeah. crazy. Yeah. Then he beats up the other guy to get retribution. So Bruno's just starting up into his uh, comeback and he's going crazy on Waldo. And the commissioner comes in and disqualifies him. <laughs> and, and, that, and that was like the straw that broke the camel's back as far as the people there. Because uh, uh, the main event usually wasn't last because they wanted to, you know, get the, uh, the restaurant had a lot of heat on them. They wanted to get them out of the building before yeah. the people left. Yeah. So they had a four midget tag match on after that. <laughs> and the people, the people were so mad at, they were jumping up and down. And I, I don't know if you were ever in the civic arena in Pittsburgh. Yes. Well, you know, the one end was like hollow underneath. Cause they used to raise like a big stage underneath when they okay. said the civic light opera in the sixties. Okay. Well, the, especially the people, the people were all jumping up and it was, the floor was shaking actually. Like you could feel the tremor, <laughs> you know, as if you had like maybe like a 2.9, uh, 
Richter uh, earthquake. You could feel your feet like like uh, uh, move a little bit. Yeah, yeah. They were and Bruno had to come out. It was like a two out of three falls midget match. Bruno had to come out to the ring between the first and second fall and take the Haas mic and talk to the people and like calm them down. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, and tell them, oh, I, I'm going to get him next month. We got to I'm going to take his boots off because Waldo was stomping him with his boots earlier, and that calmed the people down. And then there was another commissioner. Um, I heard his sons now on on the commission. <laughs> <laughs> um, his name was Joey Samino, and this guy was just like um, my way or the highway. He'd, he'd go in and change match finishes. Like they're trying to build up a heel for like a main event, and he's going in there and disqualifying guys before the match is even over, like meddling in match outcomes and everything. And I heard Bruno had it out with him a couple of times behind the scenes and stuff. Uh -huh. uh, you know, tired of this guy. You know, the guy was like five foot tall, but he thought he was Napoleon or something. You know, he, you know, he uh, ran roughshod, uh, you know, over the promotions. So, so I mean, the commission was not smartened up the stuff, right? Is that? Is that oh, they were oh, smart. They, they had Some of them guys just had like a like a power complex. Okay, know? so they yeah. they knew what was going on, but they were still. They couldn't be that thing. stupid. You know? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, they if they go to boxing events and see guys getting their faces busted open. Yeah. And then there's big 300 pound wrestlers like hauling off on each other, and they're not even bleeding until 15 minutes into the match. I mean, they yeah, should yeah. be smart. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I mean, well, so I mean, going into it again, as secretive as wrestling was in in you know starting in '75, uh, for you, like, was it a while before where you, you know, when, you know, when did you get smartened up to it, or was it, you know? Well, I was uh, already like semi smartened up before I even started Indies. Okay. But once I started Indies in '75, I was like hearing, you know, everything. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like 100 percent smartened up. <laughs> They're maybe not as great at uh, keeping the veil, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean when you're working on the show and you see the guys that are they're wrestling each other, like talking to each other. Like, yeah. You, you know, I mean, you get wise pretty quick. You know? So they weren't they weren't separating you from those kinds of things. No, or I wasn't kayfabe like when yeah. I did it. Yeah. When I when I worked for WWF. Uh, I went to so many shows that I was like timekeeper on a lot of their shows. Okay. Like in Steuben, like out of Pennsylvania, like in, when they'd run Steubenville, Wheeling, Youngstown area. Yeah, yeah. I got friendly with the ring announcer and he got me on. First, I was doing it for free and then they started actually paying for it. I'd get 20 to $40 <laughs> depending on who the agent was, yeah. like, uh, you know, to do shows and, uh, I did that to around maybe like 86 or 87. And then the, the ring crews, they started bringing in other ring crews coming in and then they were bumping me out cause they wanted to get, you know, the money I was getting, you yeah. know, uh, but I'd still go to the shows. I just had to buy a ticket then. But <laughs> <laughs> so we're having these TV tapings. Like, can we can we maybe spot you on? Some oh one? no, the TV tapings. They always brought there, in guys. The, they yeah. wouldn't trust like a local yokel for that. You know, <laughs> for a high show. Uh, well, they kayfabe me there because I, I got the ring announce like five WWF shows over the years because the ring announcer didn't show up or something or they forgot to assign one. Yeah. You know, so I actually did like five shows uh, and they kayfabe me even on those. You know, yeah. I was uh, uh, you know kept away from inside the dressing room and uh mm -hmm. well i didn't care i mean i was uh, get, getting paid you know oh, absolutely i bet it's, it's got to be such a such a different environment at that that level right so oh one time i refereed for the wwf oh yeah <laughs> yeah i was down at the wheeling civic center and i was sitting there at the dressing room because billy Berger was on the show that i knew and you know they always had a few like local guys i talked to them and and billy Berger comes out like 10 minutes before the show he said they're gonna need you in the back and I go back there, you know, and they need me to referee the first three matches because uh, the one referee had to like wrestle, you know, uh, uh, the uh, killer Joe Abbey. You probably heard of him. You know, if you go yeah. to KSWA, they, they, you know, they he's like a god the, to those people. Joe Abbey like Memorial. There. Yeah, I was just talking about last night with Brohemoth. Yeah, he was supposed to referee uh, the whole show, but since they needed him as the Red Demon in the first match, they had me do the first half of the show, and then he did. The, you know, after they didn't trust me to do the rest of it. I guess. No, no. You know? <laughs> but yeah, it's the only time I refereed on a WWF show. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, did you do a lot of refereeing? Or was that? Or... Uh, I did maybe like 50, 60 times. Okay. I only did it when I couldn't get ring announcing because I like to sit and watch the matches yeah. and write down. I had to remember all the match finishes and stuff <laughs> and write them when I got home from my record. You yeah, know? and yeah. I couldn't time the match. Either. I can't be refereeing like stopping my watch. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's I, I can't imagine a lot of these promotions, especially on the outlaw side, like took good notes on things. You know, I have, some today don't even have good results on their on their uh, Facebook or, or websites or anything like yeah. that. So. Um, yeah, a lot of them, you, like IWC, no, you don't even see the, most of the time, you don't even see the match results anywhere. No, no. You know, sometimes you do. Uh, well, I know when Norm Connors was running, when he had Steel City Wrestling, uh, I was surprised at how up to date their, uh, 
their website was somebody like Don loaded like they just had pay, pay, pay they didn't have like detailed finishes but they had Joe Blow pin Joe Blow yeah. or or whatever you know they had like years and years of them on on their site and, and I do believe that is a a as a good um uh shout for Joe Dombrowski I think was doing a lot of those write ups and um uh Jesse the Mark so I'll give shout because Jesse been oh, doing great stuff with that website over the Was years. that Jesse Forney you're talking yes, about Jesse yes. the, I, I never knew he was called that <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you never you ever yeah, heard you know, Jesse the Mark he was Jesse the Mark yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome um well now you know there you go yeah. that, that's his that's his real name to me uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so i had to go find him on you know facebook and be like what? Well, i'm always happy when he's to, uh doing the music so i'm never i'm never in the ring like like hung out on a limb you know waiting for him to start the music because somebody's supposed to come out and barge out and do a promo yeah yeah you get some of those djs that they're asleep <laughs> at the wheel and i can't start making announcements because i'm supposed to get interrupted you yeah. know but jesse's good he's always on the ball uh, there's, <laughs> al- there's always that group of people where uh you know if there's like i'm you know, recently there was like a kind of a weird show that happened here in Pittsburgh. And I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go. And then you see like, like, uh, Brandon K come up with the ring truck. And you're like, Oh, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> or you see Jesse's on, on behind the DJ. You're like, okay, yeah. this is going to be okay. Cause we've all seen those shows where it's like, Oh, Oh God, what's going to happen. Was it, have you, have you ever done music before? Have you ever held a camera before? You know, kind of stuff. Well, it's like uh, with the ring, you talk about Brandon K. Yeah. You know, he's going to show up. Uh, we had a guy who passed away the last year. I don't know if you ever heard him named Joe Perry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he um, yep. we've sort of irresponsible in some way. The show, shows actually got canceled a few times because he showed up so late with the ring. And, you know, uh, <laughs> when I heard he was bringing the ring, I always on, on uh, you know, pins and needles, you know, because he'd either be late or and some shows you know, didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, there, there's always the like, oh, no, he's in. Oh, you got it from this guy. Oh, wait, who brought the sound system? Listen, I'm. I'm well, I got stories I can tell you after. It's not about me on this show. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about the time the sound system didn't show up. Um, so. Oh, that happened to me. I, I've done ring and nonsense through bullhorns. Uh, uh-huh. Like, uh, I don't know if you ever watched the Highway Patrol, the old TV show, where he pull a, a thing out of the car and say, this is car 182 or something. I did a, a show one time, like, with a policeman's um, thing where he pulls out a, by a steering wheel to talk, you know, to the, uh, you, know, have, you, know, he, you know, where you can, like, you know, I guess that's the thing when when a, su- a suspect is like holed up in a building, uh-huh. you know, they want, they want him to give up. He'll like talk on a loudspeaker, <laughs> you know. I, <laughs> so instead of like, you know, I used that the ring on. It's like for Bubba, Bubba the Bulldog promoted show Bubba. up in Arnold, PA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so okay, go. What is what is the weirdest situation you found yourself in at a wrestling show? Oh, weird. Because uh, it sounds like you. I mean, you you've seen it all at this point. <laughs> I'm sure. Like, oh, I was at, here's a show. Um, well, uh, th- you heard of the T giant T ranch. Like, he still wrestles yeah, for KSWA. Yeah. Well, he used to promote this FMW show at this, uh, beehive theater it used to be the Kings court theater out in Oakland. I'm part of it. And, uh, there was like two, uh, groups of like, um, fans that were like, corner like, I guess they're from different promotions. I guess they were like yelling back at each other from a different part of the theater. And, 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 the uh, one guy, uh, actually, uh, you know, they uh, whipped out, pulled on his pants in the front, exposed himself, whipped out the family <laughs> jewels, like take that or something like that, or suck this, or I forget what he said. Yeah, right in front of like, everybody. It was a twenty-one and over crowd, but still, you know, <laughs> that comes to mind like right away. Yeah. Jeez. I think the guy was a brother of uh, a, a guy still involved in wrestling. I'm not 100 percent sure, so I don't want to divulge. No, the no, guy no, did no, it, no, 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 absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Anything else? <laughs> the custom <of> mind <laughs> that doesn't involve genitalia in Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh, those ACW shows are like, like raunch. I don't know how, how much I can like say on the air okay. here. Uh, good, good. But uh, there was like, um, we can add it later if it's too much. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, Jamie Dundee. He's like the son of that uh, Bill Dundee. It's like okay. from Memphis. Um, yeah. He was like managing a guy. Uh, some some guy they were given a tryout for was from like Calgary promotion. Like, I don't know if it was Mike Lozanski or some name like that. Mm-hmm. And he, he he got on the PA and told the crowd that if uh, if my man doesn't win this match, he's gonna suck the dick of everybody in the building. <laughs> like uh, and then this guy like lost the match, and then he um and then he uh sort of like uh, took it back like later. But but you could see, you used to be able to see when they used to run the CCBC Golden Dome up in Beaver County. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
you can see like Paul Heyman up there. I guess he had like a sixth sense of humor. You know, I guess that's where they got Joel Gartner from. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had all that uh, filth that he used to spew on the mic. Uh, yeah, Paul Heyman would be chuckling his head up up there. Yeah, you can see him like laughing his head off, like 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 the stuff. You know, somebody when Joel Gartner would get on the mic, and you know. <laughs> It was definitely his place to kind of push the envelope for sure. But hey, that's what well, made I, got, I think he got thrown out of that building on kind of some oh, of that yeah. stuff for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah, that was on a that's on the community college campus. I actually ne so never been to a show, even when they did the 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 you know, reunion tour a few years ago. Um, but actually I forgot to actually help um do a uh, one of their confirmations for the college. And I'm like, this is the place ECW was. Yeah, they <laughs> so. started running the um Lawrence Convention Center after that. Um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, so you, they were, like, thrown out of there, I guess, and kind of some of the stuff was going on at the shows. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't I don't blame him. <laughs> Plus, I wonder how Shane Douglas, he was, like, a part-time school teacher for, yep. like, for years. And, yep. And some, you know, the stuff with, like, Francine and, you know, uh, uh -huh. and stuff, you know, like, uh, remember Rick Rude saying, you know, that's, like, Shane Douglas, you know, he's a part-time school teacher. Francine always had her boobs, like, like, three, yep. fours hanging out. And Rick Rude was, like, the bodyguard. And he tells, like, uh, Shane Douglas, you could pay me off in cash. Then he's looking down like Francine's cleavage, or you could pay me off in gash. You know, like right on, they played that right on the air. Yeah, <laughs> I know somebody that actually uh, he was he was at least their substitute teacher growing up. But I went to college with so. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Troy Martin. Mr. Troy Martin. He's <laughs> yeah. still out there. He's still in the area doing something. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, oh jeez. Oh man. Oh uh, well. Um. Um. It, any other great story? I feel like I just can ask you for stories for the next hour at this point. So, um, any, anything else that's less controversial that you got into? I'd say just like you know, uh, 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 you know, you know, what, what, how how are you with the kind of evolution of indie wrestling? Again, you know, seeing you know it, it turn into what it's kind of has here in in yeah. in let's say the twenty tens. Well, it was a it was a graveyard, like I said, till like the mid eighties. Yeah, mid eighties. It was hard to be, so hard to be profitable with the commission. Yeah. But after that, you know, you had the like in the nineties, you had this guy Sal Conti. It's pretty infamous. He started yeah. USCW. The Norm Connor started uh, around like ninety four. His Steel City Wrestling. Jim Miller started uh, running live shows in uh, ninety five. It really like snowballed after that. And, like, mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. and his brother is running. Uh, yeah, because now, you know, you didn't have all the as much of the overhead, you know, when, when the commission was involved. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it snowballed from kind, that Kind point. of for yeah. better and for worse, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my bookings went up because, like I said, from 75 to mid-89, I could only work out of state legally. Yeah. You know, and after that, I could, like, work on anybody that wanted me now. You know, so it really, really helped me once Vince McMahon told everybody was fake and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and he got rid of the PA Athletic Commission. At least, at least for the most part, he got mm -hmm. rid of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you have that much power, I guess, right? So, yeah. I mean, because he ran most of his tapings like the other end of the state, I think, right? So, well, like, yeah, he, he, he didn't dare run in Pittsburgh uh, yeah. because, you know, they had, you know, he had to use all those local yokels until 89. And then after that, the city of Pittsburgh, for years, they had a 10% amusement tax. Mm -hmm. and they didn't want to give away, run a pay per view and give away, who knows, they might have uh, tried to tax the pay per view revenue too. Yeah. He didn't yeah. want to give away 10% to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, to the city of Pittsburgh. Geez, that's wild. I'd like to close this off with a little bit of uh, the highs and lows here. So what is the best and the worst thing about you working uh, around, I, I would say indie wrestling, but you're kind of all wrestling <laughs> for you. Well, I like when I get to work to show because I can get the right spelling of the guys. And, yeah. And then if I miss the finish, I can go back and ask them, you know, maybe because by the time I write it down, sometimes, you know, I'm getting old. I'm getting more forgetful. I forget maybe a little bit of what led up to the finish. I'll ask them, you know, what they did. Or if I don't know the name of the hold or maneuver or something, you know, I can like actually go back and talk to the guys. But when I'm at the show, well, I don't go to live shows anymore unless I'm working. But years ago. I didn't want to go up to the ring announcer when he knows I'm ring announcer thinking I'm trying to take his job or mm -hmm. something, you know. So uh, I would maybe miss out on like, a, like a, how a guy, what his guy's name was, that the PA system was bad or yeah. something, yeah. you know. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I like work. If I'm working the shows, that's the best for me, yeah. And the worst? <laughs> oh, and the worst about working shows, uh, when the PA systems are, are like god awful and I'm, I'm blowing my voice out by like the third match. Or, yeah. yeah. Or, or if you got like hecklers in the audience, you know, they, they try to break your concentration, you know. And, and when the PA system's bad, sometimes you're trying to make an important announcement and you got one big mouth idiot's probably been drinking. Mm -hmm. It can yell like louder than the, than the PA system, mm -hmm. you know. You know, the, you know, I hate that. <laughs> Let's, that brings you to me to one. Story. Yeah, I figured we were going to bring that up, you know. <laughs> that uh, I almost yeah. forgot to bring up here. 
Yeah. Um, because there is a there was a a particular moment, and I made sure this clip got out right away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this happened. We were still working with Fight Society. I was thinking of what I was going to say. I knew you were going to bring that up. Here. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and there's a particular point, and again, people have known you for so long, and and uh, and you're so. I mean, you're so. Listen, thank you, you're you're one of the most professional and, and see you know uh, guys out there doing this thing, you know, and, and, and consistently. Uh, for the for the years that I've known you, and uh, and and I'm sure Jesse the same way, right? Uh, it, it was the Beast Brawl I recall, which was for um, uh, the Beast. Uh, yeah, Ron Richards. Ron Richards. The moment. Beast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were doing something called a Beast Brawl, and it was kind of a Royal Rumble sort of concept, roughly. You were explaining your roles, <laughs> and, and I think Dean Radford and Brandon K were already in the ring, getting ready to go, and you you, you kind of laid it out. And, and, and do you do you want to kind of explain what happened next? <laughs> well, I know the name of the guy, but I'm not going to give him any publicity. But this guy was he's been he was a regular guy in the first row, and he'd always bring like two, three, four people with him. Mm-hmm. So. I was afraid I was maybe going to get fired by Jim Miller because he's a bottom line guy, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, he's a businessman, and and and, and those guys quit coming to the shows after that. But this guy, he, this guy thinks he's part of the show, and I, I would always just ignore it, you know, because if you, you let them know it's getting under your skin, then you're yeah. going to get, you know, I, that's how I dealt with marks like over the years, you know. Yeah. You, you try to ignore them or just like laugh at it, and so, most of the time they let up, you know, if if that's get you mad. And and this guy, what happened? This Beast Brawl show, there was people that were, were crying and upset, like relatives. It was a real yeah, emotional show. Yeah, yeah. And this this fool was uh, the, even when I'm introducing the show, he's like yelling, like saying what and like stuff like that, trying to break my concentration. And I'm thinking this fool's acting up at a show like this. This is like a lot of people there never go to shows or rarely go to shows, or, or maybe not since the days when when uh, Ron's like mother in law used to run a promotion like in the, mm-hmm. in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe not, not even have gone to a show since then. And um, yeah, and he's, um, you know, acting up like during that show. So, like, what happened in that match was I was frustrated with myself because they played, like, a, like a video before the match. Yeah. And I thought that I was going to be able to lay out all the rules mm-hmm. before they started bringing anybody out. You know, I guess there was a mis- miscun- miscommunication. And Jesse, or whoever was the DJ, played, like, Dean Radford's music. Mm-hmm. And that was the music of that, that Ron used to come to the ring from uh, the Metallica song. He always, and so I couldn't talk over that. No. And then br- he brought up Brandon K right away, and I couldn't talk over that. So during the first minute, I think the guys came in every one minute. Yeah. I just tried to go real fast because uh, if guys landed on the ramp, you know, during Battle Royal, sometimes they were allowed to go back in and sometimes they weren't. The rules changed over yeah. the years. Yeah. And this idiot, I'm trying to read the rules, and he's like yelling, like in the middle, like you know, he's big Moss is like as loud as the PA system. You know, nobody wants to listen to him, mm. and uh, and I just like lost it there. I mean, I, I figured it must have been divine intervention because I, I never do that. I do a slow burn, but I, I don't like <laughs> like 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 flip out like that. I said something to the effect like, uh, "This show isn't about you; it's about the B show." Shut the bleep up! You know? <laughs> so, so I used the F word, the F bomb, and. Uh, and really, nobody complained. I went to Quinn after oh, the show it, and apologized to him. I says, uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, it must have been divine intervention. God must have wanted me to do that or something. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that guy had it coming, I, you know. And people, everybody, all the reaction I got, everybody was happy because this guy was getting on so many people's nerves, uh, you know, like ruining their experience at the show with his big moth. You know? And it came from, like, probably the last person they expected at that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, that's so. what God must have intervened there. Yes, you know? yes. I, I was speaking for God, you know. <laughs> yeah, like the wrestler yelling at well, the wrestlers yell at you. Like, that's what they do, right? So yeah. it doesn't really stick out when it's like when when, but when Hank Hudson talks, <laughs> it's going to be a bit more important. Well, so. one, one of the wrestlers told me, he said, that guy, you know, He'd be at ringside. He was like a manager for a while for like yeah. a year. Yeah. And he said that guy's just like so ignorant. You yeah. know, he, he was uh, just obnoxious like all the time. Yeah. yeah. So well, he had it coming, you know, even though I, I I feel embarrassed that I did that because it didn't make me look good for saying that. <laughs> you know. uh, I, I, so so uh, from this point on, I, maybe if you saw the post or we ended up booking this interview, uh, I, I refer to you now as Hardcore Hank. Uh, <laughs> that's why I knew it was coming. <laughs> I saw that hardcore on there. Um, and, and, uh, and, uh, I, I believe in our discussions about what to do with fight society in the presentation, I did, did, I think you were being told by the booker to do more of that <laughs> afterwards. Oh, Quinn, after that, he started me, he had me do like a, a few like, uh, segments or something, you know, yeah, where, where I was yeah. like, you know, like, a. 
like a one match commissioner and yeah, all that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That lasted like maybe like three or four times. You know, <laughs> then uh, that 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 got buried back of the booking uh, priorities. Oh, uh, but we, yeah. hey, we're trying things, trying things for sure, especially at that time, trying to keep that thing going. But uh, oh man, Hank, it has been. I say it is a pleasure to have uh, worked on shows with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you back here in the studio again. Um, and uh, and and, uh, and I hope. I hope you, everybody. First of all, where, where can people find you online and, and check out some of the history that you've been posting again? Okay, I, I'm only on Facebook, yes. and it's uh, under my real name, Henry Klemkowski, but I have in parentheses Hank Hudson. So if you search Hank Hudson, it'll take you to the page, and there's like mm-hmm. five years, of probably a thousand plus of uh, retro reports. And the rest of them are on the Studio Wrestling Fan Club page. Okay. I used to post them directly on there first, yeah. then share them to my page. So you can go to the Studio Wrestling Fan Club page. There's posts from like 1961 shows up till uh, up until like run right before WrestleMania. You know, that uh, there's wow. like hundreds on there too. Yeah. It's great, uh, great stuff like that. Great stuff like old, you know, like I say, old PWX, old you know, a lot of names that you you probably uh, you know some of the, some of the older veterans that we've had on the show. You'll you'll see some of those listed in there as well, yeah. and just uh, you know, let's say the old WWF, WCW cards from the filmings in the '90s. That's a sweet spot for me, uh, personally. Uh, it's been really cool. You, you definitely brighten up my uh, Facebook feel, feed for sure. Uh, there, Hank. Yeah, and it's all 99 percent out of my archive or my memory. It's not mm-hmm. like something I just read off the internet like uh, five minutes before. Like a lot of people, you know, it's all it's all mine. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Hank Hudson, go check him out. Thank you so much. You'll hear his voice again all over a lot of the content, especially with Rise Wrestling. Uh, and I don't even know how many other promotions that we've worked with over the years over at IndieWrestling.us. Um, and clips over on the YouTube page, and and uh, especially, especially that infamous clip that we just talked about. <laughs> and, and of course, the um, story being told by Mick Foley uh, during that WBW show in the in Campbell, Ohio, with uh, uh, just look for Lady Frost and Jocelyn there. I'm going to try, try to get those links for you guys in the show notes as well. Uh, thank you so much, Hank. Thank you, everybody out there. And please, until next time, uh, take care of each other and support indie wrestling. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.